Now let's check out the uh, reader side of things on the Note tab. So as you can see on the side here, we'll talk a little bit about the user interface uh, after the reader stuff. But um, yeah, we got notes, task lists, offline books and office documents. So basically, yeah, you have like four different categories of um, documents and organization of things that you may want to do. So uh, in order to manage your books, there are two ways around it. The obvious one that you may want to try at first is to go to offline books. And you will see here that I have some of the books that I have already accessed and all that kind of stuff. Now, when you are um, in offline books, you need to keep in mind that this is treated like a separate app. And the best way to think about this is that this is your library app. Now, if I just go to local import, you won't find them, find anything there. Um, the reason behind it is that basically the easiest way to do this is if you want your books to appear in your library automatically, you go to your local storage and when you're in your local storage, you place all of your books that you want to have access to into the books folder. Now, I didn't want to do that because it's an Android, so I'm using my G Drive Sync app. So I have all of my documents uh, synchronized here as I have them with the other devices. However, the good thing is that once you access any document from anywhere at all, so let's say I go here into Eventide and I go to, hmm, let's say here, and I open it with Notea PDF, which is the default one. And now after a moment, it opens it up, blah, 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 and that's all good. And once I actually go out and I go back to my offline books, there we go. This is even though it's weirdly named because that's how the, the it kind of understood it. But that is the document, the last document that I opened. So um, these are now arranged by last access. You can also switch to the uh, yeah, library mode and you can, of course, organize your library in folders by creating folders, subfolders and all that kind of stuff. So that's your general organization of uh, things. Um, now, as far as the reader capabilities go, I'm going to take a look at uh, EPUBs and PDFs separately because they do use different apps. So for EPUBs, um, first question, does it support EPUB 3? Yes, it does. So it opens it up and there you go. So this is an EPUB 3 book that is normally accessed and seems to be going fine. Uh, do hyperlinks work? Um, yes, they do. They work like this. And this is basically how a book looks like. You navigate by tapping to the side, left or right for forward, and you tap in the middle to access the um, menu stuff uh, as standard as it gets. As far as swiping goes, yep, you can swipe as well. That works too. Can you pinch to zoom? Yes, you can. Can you pinch out? Yes, you can. So pinch actually works uh, for changing the scale of the font. Now, you can't scale to less than the minimum that you have. And there's a also prefixed maximum that you can get to. And these are accessed by tapping in the middle and going to the AA or the formatting option here. And then you have these six or five sizes rather. So you can go from this one to this one. Not a huge range, but perfectly usable as far as I'm concerned. You also have a couple of different uh, typesetting options that you can go through and a couple of different fonts that you can choose and go through. Um, as you can see, the performance of EPUB reformatting is extremely fast and something that's totally normal. So it's able to do that well. And also for those interested, you have dual control, separate control for contrast for text and for pictures for those EPUBs that have that kind of stuff. Additionally, we also have the support for the auto rotation. So if I rotate the book, it will rotate normally like this and it will work. So that is a good thing to see. Of course, you can just go down here and yeah, you can just 
use however you want it the auto rotation works really really well if you don't want auto rotation you have the option either to um, set it here in the settings where is it i guess in more settings maybe there we go rotating on and if you do not want that then we shall go back to our last apps let's see there we go notea reader um yeah you can also i guess fix yes following the system vertical or horizontal screen so you have enough uh control over the rotation as well so that you can make it work the way you want it to um uh, next to it you have the progress bar nothing fancy there you can jump between chapters as expected i believe ah yeah, well, there you go. That doesn't work. And you can return to the previous location. Then you have your table of contents. If the book has contents, this one doesn't. And this is where you will find your bookmarks as well. Additional settings that you can choose also here in the bottom corner are refresh modes, HD for the best, normal for a good compromise, extreme speed mode has some quality degradation, but it also does offer very nice speed because then the reading becomes super super responsive and the page flipping is very very cool additionally you also have the ability to uh, set the refresh rate so it can uh, fully refresh the screen and get rid of any ghosting if you may have it every five pages 10 20 30 or not full brush i am i that's basically not uh, refreshing at all and if you want to you can manually refresh up here and of course you have the ability in the upper right corner to bookmark a page and yes it is a two-step for whatever reason i don't understand why it's not just a tap in the upper right corner but you have to go into the menu and then you have to tap to actually get to the bookmark and you can do a word search through the document or cancel if you will long press on a word will underline it now um, at first i was a little bit kind of weirded out because you can copy underline annotation and translation all kind of self-explanatory but basically um, the way it's supposed to be used is to press and drag and then kind of underline like this and then you have an option of underline or annotation so let's say that i want to make this an annotation and there we go and i can just say this is my annotation and let's put in a uh, a space well not there we go this is my annotation okay so i can save it and i there we go saved and gone however um if i make now a selection here and i make this simply an underline i don't have any kind of distinction between the two there is absolutely no indication between what's an annotation and what's an underline and furthermore if you access an underline it's simply the same kind of thing it just doesn't have any annotation it's not a big deal um, except that these icons are not that responsive as you've seen i had to press several times on the save and several times on the x so the the, the touch boxes are a little bit off but i do find it kind of odd that there is absolutely no control over the formatting of the underlining or uh, the characterization of which underline has an annotation or doesn't now this wouldn't be a problem at all if we would have some sort of searching through our annotations but unfortunately when you actually go to your contents and bookmarks only the bookmarks show the underlines actually do not show so if i go back uh, to the previous page i believe the previous page is the one that's bookmarked or the one before it yeah well i guess the easiest thing is to actually go to the bookmark <laughs> and unbookmark it okay so let's go there and bookmark exists so how do i remove it oh you can't remove it like that you have to what you gotta do here maybe long press yes long press and then delete the bookmark so yeah what i wanted to show is that 
underlines and annotations are not searchable. So if I go through a whole technical document, user manual or what book, whatever it may be, and I do all of my annotations, what, what's the point? I mean, why, why, why would I do that when I can't really find them? Do I really have to go through each page? I mean, I, am, I haven't been able to find an option that actually gives me uh, yeah, access to that. And furthermore, I don't have any page options or page overview or anything like that. It's just the progress and that. So overall, okay formatting capabilities, great formatting performance, but the overall functionality is fairly, fairly limited. What is there works okay, but certainly there's plenty of room for improvement. All right, now let's check out the PDF uh, functionality in Reader because it's a different app. So now I'm gonna open up a PDF, uh, which is a user manual, which is not optimized for um, this kind of thing. So now let me just reset the formatting so you can see what the original size and look of the document is. Uh, overall, the performance is really good. So the same type of kind of controls you tap on the side and it seems to be working quite well, except that in the PDF Reader, we do not have swiping. So the swipe control does not exist. It's only tapping or yeah, nothing at all. Now the same thing, uh, something I forgot to show in EPUBs, but it's something I talked about. You can use the page forward and back on the pen um, and it works the same on EPUB reader and a PDF reader as well. So that's something that's really, really cool. Oh, and one thing that I also forgot to mention about EPUBs, you cannot write your notes on EPUBs. The, the pen doesn't work. It doesn't have the functionality of, you know, uh, writing on top of your EPUB. So that's also not a good thing. That is not the case on PDFs. So on PDFs, you definitely can write and you can enable or um, yeah, change the settings here via the uh, upper menu brush, erasure, eraser, you, you also have bookmark as well as before, full screen refresh and some additional settings that you can find here for the, mainly basically for the dictionary. Uh, at the bottom of the menu that you get when you tap the middle, so same type of controls as before, we have the rotation, so auto rotation, horizontal vertical uh, setup and as you can see if you flip it around uh, the auto rotation does its job you just kind of give it a little nudge it turns around and figures it out it's not the fastest in the world but it does get there it's not you don't have to like shake it and yell at it come on um, it it gets it uh, fairly quickly. Then we have the crop control. Unfortunately, pinch to zoom does absolutely nothing because it's not there. It does not exist as a function. Uh, instead, we have these uh, fit vertical option which is usually the best option to have for documents and uh, it retains the crop value across the document which is really cool because then you can set up your crop and you know just kind of keep it for the document and then you know it can fit nicely we have also fit horizontal in this case you will have some cropping going on so it's cutting it down here and then i can tap next page and it goes just down and then to the next page this is especially useful if you have have a document that's kind of weird uh, formatted or something like that or you want to have it in the landscape mode because then it becomes incredibly easy to actually just go through the document very very nicely and uh, suddenly something that's not so readable becomes extremely easy to kind of navigate and deal with uh, when you're doing this. One thing I haven't tried yet is uh, what happens to writing when we change crop and orientation so let's now change the orientation let's see okay it's good i believe yeah yeah it's still good or is it let's see yeah it is good it retains its position in the document which is good and if we change our crop value, it should also stay the way it is. So the writing is correctly applied to the uh, document itself so that it formats with 
the crop. Um, that's not the case for all of the readers out there, so that's a good idea to check. You also have the ability to uh, fit width and height. Now be careful with this one because what it does, it will stretch stuff out. So it will stretch images and all that kind of stuff. So I don't find it nice because usually it either squishes or stretches everything too much. And then I just find it kind of weird, but it certainly is something that can be useful for some uh, sort of application. Now let me reset this and then go to the final option, which is manual crop. And in a manual crop, you can just freeform define uh, the area that you want. And once you apply it and say, okay, that's the crop that is being used for it. However, as you can see, you can have that stretch effect happening if the aspect ratio is not respected. And unfortunately, we do not have an option to um, yeah, respect the um, aspect ratio. So I am allowed to do something crazy like this and it's just going to look incredibly weird. So yes, I find it useful that we have an option like this as well, but it could be even more useful if we just had a checkbox here, like preserve aspect ratio on or off so that you can avoid this kind of a stretchy kind of thing. So now I'm going to go back to the vertical fit because that's the best fit for um, most of the documents. Then we have control over the overall contrast. There is no control for text or images separately and it goes from shallowest to deepest contrast. So depending on how bad your PDF scan copy of a document is, you can make that text punch up or if it's too overexposed, then you can lower it down and make it more readable. So, okay control overall, nothing mind blowing. I mean, then you have the progress, which is pretty much exactly the same as before, except this time um, the, um, the, the, the navigation between um, uh, chapters works. And we have our table of contents. There we go, nicely indented. And the same situation as with the ebook uh, reader. There's no way to actually have annotations here. Well, uh, in this case, it actually makes sense because unfortunately, all you can do is select text and you can copy, translate, or use a dictionary on it. Uh, but there's no way to underline, to highlight, or to, yeah, annotate. Because as soon as I'm done with it and I don't do copy or anything like that, it's gone. So the only way that you can highlight is not even highlight. You can just underline your documents. And even when you do, there is no way to search for that. Because, again, we have just bookmarks or contents. They're, so it's extremely limited and I'm not uh, not a fan of this because uh, yeah, I, I, I always use uh, all sorts of marking ups and that's one of the reasons why I prefer uh, the, the Note Air and why Note Air is my, my daily driver because I do a lot of reading and I do a lot of document markups and you know, if I, if I can condense a um, 600 document down to 60 pages that are relevant to me and a couple of markups and quotes and I can easily export that, then that's an invaluable tool for me. Um, this one, unfortunately, doesn't have that functionality. So that is definitely a negative point. Uh, we have also the ability to you know, have the document overview and you can go standard from nine or four or a single page. So pretty standard stuff there. Finally, we also have the refresh controls, so 5, 10, 20, 30, or no refreshes at all. And also you can change the quality from HD normal to extreme, which is going to cause some picture degradation, but it's also going to speed things up quite dramatically. As you can see, uh, the ghosting is not that bad at all, yet you have a dramatic speed up on a very, very demanding document. So because it has very high res images and all that kind of stuff. So this is definitely a cool thing to have this control for the refresh options and the quality of the picture. 
Uh, hyperlinks in PDFs also work and they work as a direct tap. It's not like in EPUBs where you actually have that confirmation. Are you sure you want to go? No, in here it normally just takes you there. However, you don't have that option to just quickly go back. I think you can maybe if I just go like this. Will it remember? It won't remember. Well, that's that's a shame. That should have worked. That uh, yeah, that that should work. But it doesn't. So that's the reality of it. All right. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna do a couple of markups. And of course, you can't choose a different type of pen. You can just choose the size of the brush. And no, no grayscale colors or anything like that. Very very rudimentary stuff. So let's just kind of mark some stuff here because I'm gonna be exporting this to test now let's do like this on my computer yes okay so it's just basic kind of a markup stuff on <laughs> for whatever reason on page 97 i should remember that and then check it out on pc to see how it looks like when it's exported and how do you export stuff? Well, you can't really share from here. There's no option to just go here and uh, kind of share. Instead, what you need to go is you need to get out of the document um, and then you can long press on it and then you can other share. So then I can just choose other share and then I can choose where do I want to share it to. And in this case, I'm just going to save it to the drive, uh, to Google Drive so that I can compare it with the rest of the stuff that I have. So there we go. Yes. Oh, this is one of the bugs that I wanted to show because it's kind of weird and it took me a while to figure out how to get out of it. So if you are in a situation like this, this can help. So um, this is like an impossible situation unless you employ a trick. Uh, it automatically is opening up the virtual keyboard, but the virtual keyboard is automatically hiding the option to finish this and I cannot get out of it. Seemingly the way to get out of this situation is to actually tap on a folder where you want to go. That's going to take the keyboard away and you just confirm that you want that folder with the select. And now you have the option to press save and to save your uh, exported PDF. Yeah, talk about backwards, but that's what you got to do. All right, so here I have the downloaded exports from note taking and uh, marking up of a PDF document. So let's check out first the PDF document. Let's uh, put it up here. Let's see, there we go was page 97. So here are the markings that I've done and let's see how does it export. Well, not the best. <laughs> it's kind of wee. Um, similar to um, how, uh, I don't know which one, I believe, I'm not sure which one was the last one I was testing that had this, uh, maybe it was Ellipsa. But yeah, definitely not the best interpretation of the vectors upon exporting because it's most certainly not like that on the device itself. So there's no need for it to be like that. So definitely something that should be improved. However, on the plus sides, they are not rasterized and they are as vectors. So you can move them around and do what you will with them. Does stuff improve once you move it? Yes, it does. So that's one of the simple ways that you could. It just shows how uh, kind of not good the export it is. Um, but yeah, as soon as you move them around, they will get smoother. So you can actually automate this and uh, get a smoother result. But the device should do that on its own so that you don't have to take this and move it to kind of get better uh, results, especially, yeah, here we go. The curly ones move smooth. So it should be like that, not like this. So this is the end result that we should have upon the exporting.
And a couple of people asked, does uh, MDO work or My Daily Organizer, does it work on Notea? I'm using the books uh, version, so the uh, My Daily Organizer, the books format, because it's centered. And as you can see, it works nicely. So you can tap on the month, it takes you to the month, you can tap on the day, it takes you to the day, daily notes, everything seems to be working as you would expect it to. You can take your notes here and enjoy a better planned month <laughs> so that definitely works and it seems to be responding very very well especially because there are no additional confirmations or anything like that performance seems to be very very cool so everything seems to be going okay so yes on the question does the uh, my daily organizer work on notea yes it does that is very, very cool. Now, there's a couple of other things that we should cover. The first one that I want to cover, so we covered notes, we covered offline books or the reader side of things. And then we have these two, task lists and office documents. Well, they're a little bit misleading, but let's check out the task list. They're fairly straightforward, uh, but they're also really, really simple. I mean, if you want to have a new task, you press on a new task, you enter the uh, my task name right and then here i just write in the task um description right and then in the upper range here you have an option to adjust your pen and you have normal same pen types and options as you would have in your notebook so same thing for the uh, eraser rotation undo redo and then you have two things that are kind of or three things that are important undone means that it's not checked so it's not yet done or it's pending the task is pending done means task is done or you can move the task to the top of the list so uh, or you can delete the task so by default it's undone and then you go save and once you save it the my task name is here and then you can just tap on it and it opens up the same thing that you had before now uh, the thing that i have a bit of an issue with is there's no subtask groupings there's no project to talk about so for example if i could have a folder at least that would define um a, a project that i'm focusing on and then tasks that are related to that project or uh, main tasks and subtasks that you know kind of uh, comprise this none of that is present here unfortunately you only have done and undone and uh, yeah the way that works is as you probably have imagined once i go into a task and mark it as done again it's like why Am I not able to just simply do a check mark here on the side and mark it done? I mean, this is a, a, an unnecessary step of going there, mark it done, and then if I go into uh, the done section, then it's there. It's it's uh, yeah, this this is um, not refined at all as far as the user experience and user design goes. So there's a lot more work that can and should be put into this section because as it is now it's not that useful but with a little bit of effort this can become a very powerful and a very very important organizational tool so i don't see the reason of of leaving it in this state especially because it's just a couple of things to add and then it, you can elevate it to a much much better tool as it is now yeah you can do some stuff with it but it it, it um, yeah it leaves a lot to be desired and then we have something that is uh, misleadingly called office document and all that is basically it says documents here here, uh, come on, documents, uh, XLS and PPT and all that sort of stuff. But all it does is basically uh, shortcut access to uh, WPS Office Lite app. 
So what that means is that we also it comes pre-installed with the um, p -p 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 let me there we go WPS Office Lite, and that's basically your office packaging for um, Android and it's included here and it's there. So um, the thing that I find kind of strange is what is the purpose of this completely? Because I cannot, I don't have a shortcut to create a new document. I don't have a shortcut to create a new XLS or PPT document. I can just use local import and that, that, that thing really confuses me. I still, honestly, I still haven't fully figured it out. What what does it mean and what does it do and uh, the user manual is in french so the only thing i could do was uh, do a batch translate to one of the services and i read through it but i the translation obviously got lost in translation the meaning of or the functionality of the local import so it would be a good idea and a good starting point to at least have the user manual in english that actually explains these things uh, however, if you do have a document file exported or anything like that, then you can access it through here. And all it does is basically opens up the document file in WPS Office Lite. So um, that's, I'm, I'm going to get back to it, how it works and all that kind of stuff that we'll talk about that. But basically that's what Office document is. And I don't see, I think that it can be done better. Right now, uh, I would much rather have WPS, off, uh, WPS Office Lite as a shortcut on the side and then have the ability to uh, actually create a new file, you know, so that I can choose, I can create a new document, new presentation or a new spreadsheet. So those are the things that I believe are important. Um, now, as far as all of this goes, how does it work? Well, uh, workbook works uh, normally. So let's, uh, yeah, there we go. This was just a little test that I was doing with an XLS spreadsheet. It just works like a, any other spreadsheet and you can use the pen, of course, to, um, yeah, simplify the input uh, sliding to the side and to the back now here at this point it would be good if the system had a refresh control rate system wise but it doesn't so we don't have an option to speed things up we don't have an a2 refresh mode so everything is going to be slow very very slow so that's something that's definitely lacking from the whole thing but the functionality itself works as you would expect it to double tap to open up um, um, double tap to open up the formula stuff formula copying pasting everything and formatting you know it's a it's a wps office light app on an android 8.1 that's that's all it is so if you know how that works if you don't know how, how that works open up uh, open it up on your phone or your tablet you'll see how that works and then you'll see that it works the same way here just a bit slower with the refresh rates because we don't have an a2 mode now, what about the user interface as a whole? Well, um, it's, I think it's, generally speaking, it's good because it's very clear and easy to get into. It's very easy to understand and um, it, it's easier to read as well. So this makes the learning curve, which often is associated with Android devices as a bad thing, it makes it less steep. So generally speaking, we have your uh, notifications bar or main toolbar on the top. You always have your home icon, you have your apps. So this is the list of apps that are installed. We have the newly added global handwriting on. We have our memory clear manager or multitask manager thingy. Ah, that's a, a go away. You, know, you got to tap, yeah, to tap out of it. Then you have your settings, which we've already shown. So you have your Bluetooth, volume, screenshots, mirror cast, refresh, uh, and uh, speed up basically just uh, frees up all of the um, freeze up the memory and you have a little bit more of the system setup now while i'm already on the system setup you have your wi-fi and bluetooth connectivity then you have your smart pen connection calibration and pen buttons because uh, the functionality especially particularly of the power button is something that can be customized so you can customize uh, to these functions here you can pause and read what they are uh, what a single click does what a double click does and what a long press does of the power button on the pen does so that's 
pretty pretty handy um, you have your back button which is always present but you can also do that with your pen so let's say that i was in a smart pen here and then I, if i use my smart button and it's configured that the single click is a back function right double click is home function long press is power key so let's say i just want to go back i just press the power button here and if i want to go home i just double click it and i'm home and if i long press it powers down long press powers on and there you go i really really like that uh, uh functionality here what would have been even cooler is if we had like customization for system-wide uh application for these two buttons as well then it could become like basically a remote control for this tablet which is potentially pretty pretty sweet um, as far as more settings go, there's very limited options. You have your rotation, device password, language, date time, sleep time, system update about the machine and Google service certification. Now, Google Play is not enabled by default. You have to go through the process of enabling it. If that's something that you want to do, then you need to download the user manual and translate the user manual to English and then read through the user manual so that you can go through it. It's a very standard procedure, but it's detailed description there to follow along. The only thing that's really, really important to know is that if you have a Google uh, account that has two-step verification on, turned on, that Google account cannot be used for the initial registration of this tablet to the Google Play services. So what they officially uh, advise is that you open up a separate Google account, use that to register the device, and then you can use your other two-step verification, <laughs> your two-step verified account to log into the actual Google Play Store kind of backwards if you ask me but i believe that that has to do with the date or the the fact that they're using a dated software such as uh, google android 8.1 so i might be mistaken but either way um that's 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 a workaround solution at best if i'm generous but yeah once you do it it does work so yeah just so that you know what uh, what to expect once you do have it you will have your google play store here as normal and it's a little bit kind of slow to kind of get there but it does get there eventually however then you have the issue of not having a2 mode and not having an option to control our refresh speeds on the system base on the system level and then yeah your google play experience is going to be slightly diminished because it looks like this which is not pleasant However, all of the stuff works, and if you have uh, apps that still support Android 8.1, then they will work. This means, does the Kindle work? Well, yes, it does. So here it is. My Kindle is there in all of its banded glory because we don't have good dithering so now it's loading and there we go i've already used it so now it already loaded up my previous uh book that i was reading and uh again uh because it's android 8.1 it's going to use an older version of kindle app as well so you might not have all of the features um that the kindle app uh yeah, on android 10 or on android 11 has so just keep that in mind but does it work yes it does is it blisteringly fast nope is it painfully slow nope it's perfectly adequate so for reading i think it just works fine and it's it's a very normal kindle experience now um you can install you what browser you want and all that kind of stuff but again the absence of the a2 mode does hinder the experience of transfer transforming this into an ordinary tablet so um yeah don't don't expect that from the notea at least until they decide to maybe implement a system-wide refresh control so that we can have at least the a2 mode there um on the side here we have a sidebar which we've already seen these are basically your shortcuts to different apps so those are just your apps so you have by default we have notes task lists offline uh, the books or library office documents storage local storage is pretty cool normal access to your storage so i do like that's one of the advanced or or advantages of an android system is that you have your full access to your folder structure in the system so it's something that's pretty pretty sweet if you know what you're doing then 
and then afterwards comes the list of your installed apps and how do you add an application well at the very bottom of the whole thing you have the plus button add application and then you choose which application you want to add so let's say that i want to add my uh, gmail or but here's the thing again it's like i've added an app and it's like oh where is it well it has been added but you got a slide well it, it should do that on its own and you should have some indication of you know that i can slide here or not but let's say for example that i add edge i haven't tested out how edge functions let's try edge and how it opens up did I press it? Yes. As you can see, a little bit kind of slow. Turn sync so that I can get all of your data and know everything about you and we can trade everything for monies. No, thank you. Uh, no, thanks. Everything. No. Everything. No. Okay, dokie. So let's uh, let's open up uh, my web page. My deep guide.com my doige doige to yeah, that that's not it let's try again deep there we go guide dot com okay there we go he found it and let's see loading yeah slow but it does move whoa okay kind of slow yes accept yeah well the performance i mean i know that uh, i have optimized my site not to be that slow so that's something that i've kind of paid attention to but it it is having issues here and it's oh it's trying to play all the animations and things it's it's acting as if it's a uh, um, yeah, so this is your web browsing experience of a little bit uh, more content rich uh, 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 website. And yeah, it's not that great. So that's the part that I was talking about that uh, we have absence of A2 mode and the general speed of the device. It has to do with Android 8.1. It's simply not that optimized and it's not entirely down to the quad core CPU. I think it has to do with two gigs of RAM and uh, Android 8.1, which was definitely um, not that good with the resources that it had to work with. So we, everybody who's been on Android knows about that. So, um, yeah, so, but it, it, is it usable? Yeah. If you really, really want to and have to, yeah, you definitely can use it, but you better allocate some time for your, uh, browsing experience. Cause, uh, yeah, it takes time to load this stuff. It takes actually quite a bit of time so much so that I'm going to stop it now additionally uh how do you get rid of an app so i for example let's say i decided well that really blows so i'm never gonna use edge well you long press and then you delete right or then maybe i want to change the order uh, gmail modify can i change the order no i cannot i can just can i drag and reposition mm. no I cannot. So you can only append to the end of the list the apps that you add. Well, not the best if someone asks me. But it certainly would be better if you could rearrange things uh, a little bit more. But that's how it works. So generally speaking, the UI, as I said, it's easy to pick up, but uh, it has its, you know, kind of uh, 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 problems. And also it suffers a little bit from uh, too many steps or unnecessary button press presses and unoptimized number of steps needed to reach operations that should and can be reached more easily and quickly. And that's something that does translate into these built-in apps as well, as you've probably noticed that you have to go there and there and there, for example, bookmark and some other things as well. One thing that I also find um, kind of odd is that if I tap here, I can get my Wi-Fi, right? And that, that works, that's consistent, that's great. If I tap on the battery, I don't get my battery management. If I tap on a date, I don't get my calendar or date. If I tap on this, I don't get my pen calibration and all that kind of of stuff it's just the wi-fi so i really don't uh there's some inconsistencies here and some of the elements seem like it's not completely mm, cohesive yet or maybe even not completely finished so uh, it, it's um 
um, the UI itself, I think it won't win any design or optimization awards, but it is very, very functional and it makes it extremely easy to pick up and use. And ultimately, when you boil everything, you know, uh, what it comes down to, that's what a device like this actually needs. Bottom line, UI experience, it's okay. It works, it's functional, but can be better. Bluetooth functionality is there and it does work. You can access it by going to settings and then um, tapping on the Bluetooth icon to turn it on or off, but you can long press to actually get to Bluetooth settings. Now, here's the thing. Um, it is uh, a little bit kind of sketchy, the connection itself. Uh, it took me good four tries to get the device to find this keyboard um, at all when it was in pairing mode. I don't know why that is, and I had tried basically turning it on and off or going out of Bluetooth and back into Bluetooth and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I tried waiting for a very long time and it kind of wouldn't do it, but after a while and after four tries, then it finally found the, uh, the keyboard here and once it did, it paired immediately without any problems. And once it has been paired, uh, as soon as I turn on the keyboard, it will recognize it immediately and it will connect and it'll just work. As you see, now it's already connected and that's it. So the only difficulty initially that I had was to get that pairing to begin to work as I wanted to. Um, once it worked, it's fine. So how does the keyboard work? Well, let's go to VPS or WPS office. Yeah, let's type here. So this is where my cursor is. And this is me continuing to type and work on my Word document. Um, I have all of the normal functionality that I expect from a word processor since this is a normal Android app. And as you can see, I can normally type, I think I had a typo somewhere. Yeah, there, that I expect because I, I didn't type it correctly. And um, yeah, since this is a normal app, it works as it would on any uh, other Android device. And um, it's definitely able to keep uh, able to keep up with fast typing. And yeah, it just works really, really good with the wireless kind of system. For me, um, the landscape format, the fact that you have equal sides here, and um, yeah, the 10.3 inch in landscape format makes it a very, very usable word processing uh, tool. So that's something that you can definitely practically use in the real world um, Notea 4. All right, and now it's time to test out the USB OTG capabilities. So I've been testing this out quite extensively. And as I mentioned in the beginning, the USB OTG capability is there and works for the most part what you would expect. So I have the USB hub applied and as you can see it is receiving power which is great if i take a power cable and hook it up to the power pass through initially it won't work but if i take the otg out and then plug it in with the power plugged in then it will immediately work and it will stower, start to power the um, tablet. So that's a little cave caveat, but it does work. USB storage, let me just go here into local storage so you can see how that works. Works very, very nicely. So this is a 64 gigabyte USB 3 SD card, plugging it in and it asks me, do you want to use it? Yes, I want to use it, press OK and I opening up my file manager and there it is, SunDisk USB drive, all 64 gigs normally recognized and it has very, very good and quick 
uh, access to the USB drive. So as you can see, I can um, go through it normally and I can even access and play video files. They're not going to play nice, but uh, may mainly because of the A uh, lack of the A2 mode, but they will stream fairly quickly from directly from the USB drive and the USB OTG, which is pretty cool. Okay, so that's, and this is the lack of the uh, A2 mode that's causing this kind of an update. So if it had an A2 mode, then you could actually have some more usable uh, uh, video playback. But then again, these devices are not meant for that. So I'm, I don't have a problem with that, to be honest. The cool thing is that uh, if you hook up the second USB drive, it's going to ask me the same thing again. I'm going to tell him yes. And if I go to home here um, or to the device, where is it? No, to the home. Yes, you will see something that you don't see on many of the devices. And that is we have both USB drives detected at the same time. Now, that's something that I don't see on all of the devices. And this is one of the rare ones that actually is capable of doing that. So higher marks than usual on USB storage uh, compatibility and how it works. Then I tried my SDN mini SD cards, they didn't work. I tried the HDMI out mode, didn't work, normally it does, then I've hooked it up with the phone and with the uh, regular Android tablet, so it's not the hub, it's the tablet. And I tried the LAN internet connection, didn't work either. Finally, I had to dig out an old keyboard of mine that has a cable. And if I hook that up as well, into it, Mmm, German chocolate cake. So if I tap here at the end and I press enter, there we go. There we go. My wired keyboard also works. And it works with two SD drive or two USB drives hooked up to it as well. So USB capability or USB OTG capability is pretty, pretty good. Not complete, but pretty good. Now, while it doesn't have an HDMI out, it does have a USB-C out and um, that provides for the ability to actually have wired connection uh, from your laptop or PC to this device and to use it as an external uh, display if you would choose to do that for some strange reason. Um, but the lack of A2 refresh mode again is something that I really don't, it just prevents me from ever even considering using this tablet in that manner. But just to demonstrate, I usually use Super Display. Um, I'm not using a wired connection because uh, Super Display app requires the um, device to go into the development mode or developer mode. And I didn't want to, um, yeah, didn't want to enable that because I have the wireless mode. And here it is as my third display. And as I'm going to gradually place my word in there, you will immediately notice why I don't think that this is a good idea to be used as a monitor. I do not have an option to um, yeah, adjust the speed at which it refreshes. So this is what I am stuck with. And I'm not going to bother expanding and typing or doing anything like this. I'm simply going to grab my word and slowly say thank you. But uh, no. Now, if you go to settings from anywhere, you will see the option Miracast, right? And um, that was exciting for me because it's like, hey, cool, I can actually do this. But unfortunately, I was unable to create a successful connection to any device, computer, laptop, TV, anything it doesn't matter first of all it takes like ages for it to find all the devices and even when it does and it starts attempting the connection it just gets into this really weird loop of connecting and then kind of never connects and just drops out and eventually even sometimes crashes so while the mirror cast option is there um it's 
I wasn't able to make it work. So even my TV that usually accepts any device with the Miracast to connect to it. I mean, I, I, this is the first time that I've, that I've encountered a device that couldn't do it. So it was recognized, the connection was attempted, but no results have been obtained. I suspect that the problem here is again the Android 8.1 uh, maybe it doesn't have updated standards or protocols I really don't know but I know that 8.1 uh, uh, can be a good Miracast device it's just that in this particular case it's not something that I was able to get to work.